growing weary of running from room to room, practicing one-tooth insurance-driven dentistry? Then stay tuned for the latest episode of The Lionhearted, where Dr. Steven Rasner will hand you the blueprint for what many call the gold standard of general practice dentistry. Hi, everyone. I'm Dr. Steve Rasner. You're tuned in to The Lionhearted Dentist, our weekly podcast on helping you maximize your professional and your personal lives, since they're obviously interconnected. Last week, at the end of my podcast, I was speaking to you about the power of doing the right thing and how that pays off as part of an unspoken part of the lion-hearted philosophy. And before I get into the nuts and bolts of this week's podcast, which, by the way, is another look at case presentation success, and I have specific things that we haven't talked about in a while, and it's because I wrote a recent article for a magazine, and as I was writing, I said, hey, my podcast uh, listeners would appreciate this. So a couple housekeeping items and I'll get back to that my email it's my name drrasner at aol.com please write to me let me know if this is helping many of you do I know it's a unorthodox approach to, to podcasts since I've never had a guest I try to share with you really from my gut and my recent week experiences on what I would do differently on what I've done it's worked so that lots of you can benefit from it and I know it helps some of you hopefully many of you the other uh, housekeeping business is you know write to me or write to Beth about our 2021 live surgical courses that are being put together I hadn't put them together with any dates yet because I wasn't sure what was going to happen after the effects of COVID and the pandemic. And, you know, we're right now in mid-September and about four weeks away from me hosting two live courses that are sold out. I follow very strict protocols with the patients attending, with the doctors attending. And these courses continue to sell out. So, you know that one of the recommendations I give you in the CE recommendations is having the skill set to atraumatically remove teeth and the skill set to place surgically implants in patients. And I also go out of my way to tell you that when I say that to you, you can have just an awesome surgical implant career, not even doing off the chart, challenging, difficult, ramus graph augmentations prior to the implants. You never have to even go in that water and could still have an amazing implant surgical career, which would so augment your interest every day in what you do and also augment the productivity of your practice. It's Look, I know it's not for everyone, but I have to tell you, it's been an unbelievable, it's unbelievable to sit here 40 years into a career and look back and tell you, oh my God, I would do it exactly the same way, which is what I'm telling you. Two of those cornerstones clinically, as I've just said, are the ability to take teeth out and graft. I mean, that's, that's a loaded skill set right there. The grafting part of it is a loaded skill set. And then once you, if you're going to do that, for goodness sakes, why anybody would take teeth out, be able to s- develop the sites with bone grafting, GBR, and then not want to place implants, I, I have no idea. So there are the two courses I give. Check out Beth. Get on a waiting list, even if we don't have dates, because I'm telling you, they sell out every course which I'm very happy about. So, and we also give you 
a lot of live practice management skills as well. Because what good does it do you if you know the skills, if you can't, if I can get you to communicate at a higher level to your patients, it's a good thing to get case acceptance. So back to where I said, I told you at the end of the last podcast that one of the not spoken enough protocols or, or cornerstones is doing good things, being benevolent. And that's you know a beautiful way to practice, spending a set amount of time each week providing gratuitous care for people who otherwise couldn't afford it. And you do that if it never came back to you in the form of a dollar reward, it's still worth doing. You know, at the end of any one of my, my live lectures, my last 10 minutes when I'm out there talking, no matter what I'm talking about, if it's a clinical course that I'm giving or it's a management course, uh, how to maximize your productivity type of course, the last 10 or 15 minutes is always about the benefits of giving back to the world type of projects. And so I'm giving you a couple examples of some pretty good things that happened to me in the last couple months that even if they never happened, I would tell you that you still want to do these things. And one is I provided dentistry to a convent of Nigerian nuns for maybe the last 20 years. And I've never calculated the work that I've done, but I'm sure it's in the tens of thousands. I didn't restore Duvenier cases and things like this, but I certainly provided a lot of periodontal care. And I've never asked them for a dime. I don't know how many of the nuns come to me, but you know, there's quite a few. And recently, some of them have gotten to the point where they lost the battle, the battle of periodontal maintenance. And it just wasn't worth taking out two more teeth, in my opinion, and changing into a different partial removable denture. And by the way, they, they would pay me with these gifts from the mother country. I'm not kidding, because a lot of these nuns go back every other year or every year to their motherland and they're there, I don't know how long for. I just see them in my dental office from time to time. And you know, they don't speak great English, this particular convent. Sometimes they come with an interpreter. Sometimes we just wing it. It's the truth. I smile a lot. I'm very kind. I'm, I, I'm, look at me with my hands. I, I'm, you can almost understand me if I wasn't speaking anyway. The end of that story is some of them, something changed. I don't know what changed. But they offered, because they knew they needed a lot of work to financially pay for some of the bigger things we've been doing lately. You know, and it wasn't implant cases, it was, it was denture cases. But I have to tell you that it was shocking to me and it was a surprise and, and you know, a couple of the patients, the couple of the nuns needed substantial work, maybe to remove of all the remaining teeth and a new set of dentures. And I accepted because I had done a lot of work for them over the years. So that was a, a pleasant surprise. But even more of a, of a scenario to share with you is a patient the son of another patient I treated was on Medicaid. Of course, I don't accept Medicaid in my office. Those of you that have figured out how to do that, God bless you. And by the way, I do know that a lot of, a lot of my colleagues that follow me or my thoughts have unbelievably benevolent stories of your own. I blow mine away. But I think the point 
is don't overlook this part of it. It is part of the reason to get paid up front. It's part of the reason to be productive, um, to figure it all out so you're not spending week by week running from room to room doing not productive things because it gives you the flexibility and a financial ability to give back to your communities. Anyway, a patient came in who was on Medicaid and his mouth was just atrocious. And I didn't know if this was going to make any sense because his parents who had come to me for not that long, by the way, paid for their work and had substantial work done. And I just thought, you know, could this possibly go anywhere? And I were clearly understood that I don't accept anyway. It turned out to be a pretty significant case. And you just never know. It just seems to come back in a myriad of ways to you. And it's not always like that. I mean, I ended up in one of the chicken soup for the soul books. I got a United States Congressional Award for Civic Duty. All nominated and taken and inspired by either the families of people that we've done nice things for over the years. And I don't mean just dentistry. You know, we put on community events, dinners, for the homeless, taking homeless shelters to Philadelphia. I, I, I could go on for this whole podcast. I've, I've, I'm not the kind of person that remembers all those things, uh, but when I think about it, it, it brings back great thoughts. You know, we took the children of mothers who had a history of dependency on drugs, who were living in like halfway houses, Somehow we put together a project where we took them and their children to in a nice bus to Disney on Ice in Philadelphia, which is, you know, 45 minutes from where I practice. I mean, it was a project, you know, to arrange all that. And this is years ago. And we've done so many things like that. We used to do it twice a year, to be quite honest with you. And if you want any ideas or the, logistic, the logistics of how we exactly did that stuff, I could put it together for you and tell you in an email. I could even give you the estimate of the cost. You know, and these aren't things that just were years ago. Last June, one year ago, we put on a dinner dance for the uh, ARC Association, the Mentally Challenged in our community. Look, you're not doing this if you're worried about making payroll. But I'm just trying to share with you one of the unspoken benefits of doing and following lion-hearted protocols, having a fee-for-service practice, quite honestly, being compensated for your work the way you should because you do provide a higher-end product. And you do incorporate oral sedation skill uh, sets in your practice that enable a large portion of the community that wouldn't go to a dentist if they didn't have that option. We don't even charge for that in my in my practice but in other ways it's compensated and doing that has enabled us for years to do community oriented projects so that's all i have to say about that it's pretty uh, amazing and i'm very privileged to have had those experiences and so would you be i told you i read an article recently and the name of the article was called the reasons your patients say yes or no. I don't remember the, the magazine, and I don't know if I'm at liberty to even say it right now because it hasn't come out. But as I was writing it, I said, you know, my, my podcast listeners would benefit if, if I just focused on two things out of this whole article. And the article is a cornerstone. It's, I'm, I can send it to you once it comes out. And I want to focus on two of them that I don't know if I've talked about a lot that help case acceptance. And one is the physical plan. I mean, in other words, what do they walk into in your office first time? You don't think that matters? What do they visually see? And you know me by now. So you know I'm not going to talk about the need to have all this opulent decor 
In fact, I don't think you should do that. But here's what I would do. And I'm going to actually read it because it's, it's, so well, it's so well explained by me <laughs> that, that I think the flow will be better. I wrote that it doesn't cost a lot to look Walt Disney clean, but it does require job roles. So simply assign, which is really what I do, one of your staff members to do the following task. And that would be to check, I mean this, if you, if you do it halfway, then you're wasting your time. But get one of your staff members to check your reception room several times a day, okay? And is the reading material, which I know during COVID right now, we don't even have reading material, but COVID's gonna end and the, the protocols are gonna be relaxed. So just give me a break here and keep in mind that when the time comes, and it's gonna be sometime soon, you're gonna be happy, you'll be able to have newspapers and magazines. Do they look neat? Are they trashed? Are the refreshments area, do they look deli fresh? I mean, the counter's cleaned. So we have a refrigerator. By the way, all this fluff means jack squat. If your work in the back doesn't work, if you're chronically late, if, you know, your crown comes off every six months and you're not sure why, I think you get it. We have this uh, refrigerator filled with juices and water and on top we have an assortment of snacks and yes some of the older people fill up their pockets on the way out and can i always justify the expense i've done it for so many years we just do it we replenish them and it always looks it looks inviting are all the glass surfaces windex clean we literally keep a bottle of windex right at the front desk and I have to be honest with you, it's often me walking past the front desk, which is separated by a glass door that is usually open. Sometimes it's not. And the front doors, of course, are glass and there's, it's just lots of glass around. Are they Windex clean looking? And somebody, I'll walk by and say, somebody please take care of the door. But generally, I see my staff going around, whether it's that or these sanitizing surfaces. I love it. It's the way it should be. Are the plants alive? I mean that. I remember vividly in my other office times when, I don't know how, weeks, months passed and I'd realize there's a dead plant in the corner. Come on, man. We're better than that. How about the restroom? Is it spotless? I'm sorry. It's got to be checked multiple times. The mirror, the trash can, the sink, toilet. Is it spotless? We have a basket in there of toothbrushes. They're impregnated with toothpaste. If you want to know where I get them, write to me. I don't know off the top of my head or I would tell you right now. But I'm sure I can find out. I don't want them to walk in and have one or two toothbrushes. I want it stuffed with toothbrushes. And at times we've even had colognes. I'm not kidding. Haven't done that in recent years because the truth is, maybe you shouldn't do the cologne thing. People did walk off at our colognes. So skip the cologne, but all the other stuff you need. What about your team? Whether you have two members or 20, they better know what you think is important. I've always said that. They better know that you're gonna be vigilant and if you're going to remain a fee-for-service practice, what they do around your office when you're not looking matters. So here's what those things are. Remember what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the things that we haven't spoken much of, that a patient is walking through your front door, and what are they literally seeing? Of course I don't want them to see messy newspapers or a coffee cup on the floor or a tissue Never do I want them to see that. And the only way that's going to happen, and it doesn't matter if your office reception area 
is not marble. It can't have spots on the floor. You can afford a rug. Every one of you listening, if you go in on Monday and look around your reception area, just sit down. You sit down or after work and look around. How does it look? You certainly can afford a new rug, paint or wallpaper in your reception room. And if nowhere else, well, the whole office should be fresh, but it's got to absolutely be fresh in the first thing they're going to see. So the staff, there are about eight things, maybe more. They can't be moody. All right, easy for me to say, right? I don't know. I'm going to be honest with you. I've had a big team over the years. There's been times when I've had certain segments of my team that were more difficult. It's been a long time that I've enjoyed a really good ride here. I don't have moody staff members. And one of the things I say, I say that at the initial interview. You know what I say at the initial interview? There's two things here, and I'll say something like, I don't even know if I'm allowed to say this, but I'm going to say it. I need people that are dependable. I don't do well with, with employees that call out sick a lot. I'm telling you up front, I don't know your history. I'm an easy hands-off boss. I like to give you the rules. I like to give you the policies I believe in and then let you fly. I don't want to look over my shoulder and wonder all the time if you're doing it the right way. Either you are or you aren't. And if you're not, I guess I'll find out in time. But if you call out, I'm going to know that right away. And it's just, I'm calling it the way it is. Some staff members think that's fine. And it's not fine. Because when you're not there, everybody's job just got harder. So don't write to me and send me hate mail about this particular part of the podcast. Because I understand that people do get sick. You know that I know what we're talking about here. We're talking about people that abuse the sick day privilege. So, and by the same token, they can't be moody. They got to love their job. I really do think from the sterilization assistant that turns over rooms in my office to the most advanced dental assistant to the front desk team, I think they love their jobs. They believe that you, doctor, could be the president of the ADA or the USA if you really wanted to. That's how much they believe in you. I'm talking about the team, the dream team. I haven't talked about this in a very long time, but I believe it's part of an atmosphere that you give off that leads to case acceptance. I do. They love people. It's amazing to me. As I'm sitting here telling you this, I am picturing in my head my front desk staff team I have. And I have had members, I've been in this 40 years, that weren't at this level. And this stuff's too important. If you're thinking it right now, I'm not telling you to fire them. Either you can make it better and share with you with this that I'm giving you right now, or you can't. And if you can't, you got the wrong people. They can't be moody. They got to love their job. They think they believe in you. They love people. They refer to patients by the name that's comfortable to the patient. Some patients want to be called Mrs. Smith. Not many, but they know their name, whether it's Jack or, or June or Mary or whatever. They know their name. By the way, I'm not very good at that. They remember stuff about everybody. This is the team that you want that leads to yes. They care about how they look. Okay, they don't come to work looking beat up. I'll leave it at that. They look like they dress, well, they're all in scrubs since Corona, to be honest with you. But before Corona, I would tell you they dress great. They have impeccable hygiene and a killer smile. He asked me to send you this. This is pretty good. They're passionate about what they're doing. You walk out of the treatment room 
and they know the right thing to say and not to say. And lastly, they're really hard to find. So be patient and start looking. Do you hear me? Do you hear what I just told you? Do you have that? That wasn't even, I'm not even sure that I was going to go there. I didn't really, when I read it, I didn't read it out loud, but I'm reading it out loud to you. It's pretty damn good. It's the truth, too. And it's what I have. A lot of you write to me and ask if you could uh, hang out in my office. It's just too hard. I mean, I'd let you hang out for half an hour, but that don't make any sense because you drive too far or travel too far for a stinking 30 minutes. But I would, in a sense, that you'd see that. There, I don't exaggerate anyway. It's just not my personality. But that is exactly who my team is. And needs to be your team. Because it not only leads to yes, it gives you positive karma, positive vibes. And I know it's hard to find. I can't emphasize enough that over my 40 years there have been times I don't know how it happens when I didn't have the greatest insurance de department or front desk staff but I can tell you the first one I would chart change is my front desk team not a doubt about it you can get by with a quiet reserved clinical assistant or hygienist for a while you can get by for years actually with somebody like that it's better if you don't have that it's better if you have somebody that embodies what I just said. But you can go by with non-front desk personnel that don't have every accolade I just described. But not the front desk. They have to be superstars of representing. Superstars of representing. They can't be moody. They got to look great. They got to look like they care about looking great. And they just care about people and you and your practice. God, I love even talking about it. I hope this is connecting to some of you. Listen, I thank you for checking in this week. Please write to me. Give me specifics about what you'd like me to address. Any of this stuff you want, write to me. I gave you my address already. And let's continue to fight, guys. This is not unique to Steve Rasner. Any of us, if we care enough, can have the lion-hearted practice. Have a great week. See you next week.